Well, good morning, everybody. I know I, uh, the last time I was up here was, was the first time I've, I've done a message. So obviously, they liked me enough to bring me back up here, or they were just desperate this week, and they had to put me on stage. But I like to prefer and think it was the first one. Hopefully, I did a good enough job to where they wanted to invite me back up. But I figured out last time when I was on stage, I figured out, sadly, the hard way not to mention what I dislike so much on stage. Because if you were here the last time I did a message on stage on Sunday, uh, I made the mistake of saying I absolutely hate ranch dressing. And the amount of people that approached me afterwards and said, oh, I can get you to like it. You haven't tried southern ranch dressing? Like, no, stop. It's just disgusting. I don't like it. I don't think you're going to get me to like it. So I made a commitment to myself this time, and I said, I'm only going to mention what I like on stage so I don't fall into that trap again. And oddly enough, what's really interesting about this is one of the things I listed last time I was up here on stage was I said one of my favorite things that I love and that I'm super passionate about is the Chicago Bears, all right? I love football. I'm so glad sports are back, and my team is the Chicago Bears. And what's really interesting about this is that if COVID didn't happen, I wouldn't be here today, all right? Because my fiance, who knows that I love the Chicago Bears, decided to buy me tickets to go see the Bears play the Falcons today. And so I was super excited for that. And then as you all know, I got an email later on saying, hey, we're not allowing anyone into the stadium. Here are your tickets back. We reimbursed you. And so that was probably the most depressing email that I've ever gotten in my life. It was really hard, really hard for me to swallow, really hard for me to take that. But you know, without that, it was a huge blessing because I wouldn't be able to share the word with you this morning. And coming to church is way better than football, is it not? Yeah. Yeah, I'll keep telling myself that. All right. Well, we're just going to move. <laughs> we're going to move right on with that. We are continuing on with our series this morning, talking about David. So we're diving into a series, and we're discussing and studying the aspects of David's life that we can learn from, aspects of David's life that we can take, that we can apply in our own lives. And John did a great job of explaining this last week, but I just want to reiterate, the goal of doing a, a message and a series about someone in the Bible is not so much so that we can become like that person. The goal at the end of the series of David is not that we would be more so like David, it's that we would be more so like Jesus. That is the goal. The goal is to take the good, the bad, and the ugly of David's life and see how we can learn, see how we can grow, and see how we can apply from what David did in his walk with God and go, how can I apply that to my life and grow not more like David, but be more like Jesus. I think John Piper said it best when he said this quote. He said, all heroes are shadows of Christ. All heroes are shadows of Christ. Even David himself is a shadow and just a glimpse of what we can look like if we strive to live for Jesus, if we strive to become more like him. So that is the goal of this series, is to become more like Jesus by learning from David. And so this morning what we're going to be talking about is I want to talk about the aspect of David's life when he is in the cave of Adullam. If you don't know this story, it's a, it's a really fun one, it's a really interesting one, but I've titled this message, What God Said Isn't What I See. What God Said Isn't What I See. And the reason why I titled the message this is because in this story, when David is in the cave of Adullam, the reason why he is in this cave is because just a few chapters earlier, David was the anointed king of Israel, and then you fast forward, and he is now running and fleeing for his life from a position that he should have. And so I want to discuss this morning, what do you do when God says something, but reality is showing you something completely different? What do we do? 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 12 through 13 is where this whole story takes place and where it all starts, and it says this. It says, the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. This is God talking to Samuel. Anoint David. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. We can see right off the bat that God was with David from that day forward, that as soon as he was anointed by Samuel, that the Spirit was with David from that day forward. But just a few chapters later we see a completely different result than we would expect to see. 1 Samuel chapter 22, 
verse 1. This is literally six chapters later. It says this. It says, so David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. David went from being anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel to running, hiding, and fleeing for his life. And when we take a step back, it doesn't take much time to look at it and go, something doesn't line up here. Something doesn't line up when God told him he's going to be a king, he's going to have a great position, he's going to lead people, and he's going to do an amazing job. And then you fast forward in just six chapters, he's running and wondering if he's ever going to see the light of day again. There's a difference. But I think that we can easily apply this to our own lives. I think we've all had times, whether we like to admit it or not, in our relationships with God, where we go, God said this, but I'm experiencing this. Because we all know the promises of God. We know that God never fails, and we know the call that he has placed on our lives. But sometimes when we compare that to reality, it just doesn't line up. And so what I want to discuss and study this morning is David's response. I don't want to study how he got to the cave. I don't want to study why God may have put him there. I want to study how did David respond in a situation like this one? How did he respond? I want to study specifically in chapter 22 and see what we can learn from him when we are in a season when it seems like what God said will never come to fruition. God, I come before you this morning and we just, we thank you that we have this opportunity to hear your words spoken today, and I just pray that all of our ears, all of our hearts, and all of us would just be open and ready to receive what it is that you want to say through your word this morning. God, I pray that this wouldn't be a message from me, but God, you would use me. Use me, God, as your vessel. Use me to speak and communicate your truth to your people, and may your will be done throughout this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So when I look at David's life through these short six chapters, when I look at his life from when he was anointed to when he was in the cave, I feel like I can definitely understand to an extent of what David was going through. I can relate on a few levels here about the things that David was going through because there are multiple times in my life where I expected one thing to happen and then something completely different happened. For example, me growing up in my household with my family, the number one pet of choice was a dog. That was it. Like, my, I was a dog family. That, that was hands down it. I love dogs. That is my pet of choice. When the dog passes away, we don't go and get a hamster. We get another dog. Like, that is it. We are just a dog family. So from the moment I was a kid, I had the expectation that no matter what my job was, no matter who I got in a relationship with, and no matter where I lived, the first pet I was going to get is a dog. All right, and for those of you who may be wondering why is he saying this and there are people laughing around you, if you follow me on social media, you will know that is not the case for my sad life because I, of course, am, am getting married in, in less than a month, which that's the fun part. That's the fun part. Yay, yay, he's getting married. But what's also happening is that when she moved down, she took with her a cat, all right? So I need you all to pray for me because I'll now be living with the cat, but I need you to understand the extent of this story. Because when Brittany moved down here to Georgia, she didn't just bring with her a cat. She left behind two dogs. I need you to understand how painful this is for me. She had three options, two dogs and a cat. And she chose the cat, all right? And so that, to me, I thought was one of the most hardest things to live with. But, but she came forward. She was like, listen, it's cheaper to take care of a cat. We don't need to let it outside all the time. It'll just be easier. Just let me bring the cat. Fine, whatever, take the cat. So she took the cat. That's totally acceptable. Within a few weeks of being down here, she said, well, my cat's lonely. It needs to have a friend. And so I'm like, well, of course, a perfect opportunity for a dog. No, no, that's not, no. So literally, we're in this situation. I'm like, let's get a dog. This will be perfect. And so she's like, no, because it's still too expensive, and we can't find someone who can take care of it all the time if we have to leave the house. So she's like, I've got a brilliant idea. Let's get another cat. And immediately, I'm like, no, 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 listen. If the cat's bored, if, it's, if it needs a friend, let's get creative. Let's get a turtle. I don't care. Like, why do we need two cats? 
And so obviously throughout much conversation, and by much conversation I'd be mean going, yes dear, we got two cats now, and I now get to look forward to moving into a household with two cats before I ever even get married to her. And as you can tell, I am so excited. I, I can't begin to tell you how thrilled I am to live in a place with two cats. It's, oh, God has blessed me. But that is definitely a situation where I've just not, not expected this. I did not expect this situation growing up because I was grown and raised in a household that dogs were the main pet that we have. It was definitely a situation I didn't expect. Even more so of a situation I didn't expect was when I was a kid, specifically from middle school to high school, I had this expectation that I thought adults, specifically my teachers and parents should know what the difference between identical and fraternal twins are. I think you will be shocked to know how many adults don't know what the difference between identical and fraternal twins are. And the reason I say this is because I'm a twin. If you don't know that, I have a twin sister. She still lives in Illinois. And growing up throughout all of middle school and high school, we were always asked, are you two identical, all right? If you don't know, if you are a twin and the twin is of the opposite gender, you cannot be identical, okay? Some of you may not know this, you're welcome, you now know. But when we were always asked this question in middle school, and we were always asked this question throughout high school, teachers, adults would come up to us and be like, to our faces and be like, are you identical? And we're like, no, what? No, no, we are not, we're not identical. And so we thought they knew that, but apparently they didn't. But what was more shocking was when we went to high school and they still asked, are you two identical? At this point, we just had fun. They would like walk up to us, are you two identical? We're like, oh yeah, yeah, of course. Of course we're identical. And immediately that was the worst response we could have had because what's the number one thing they say the moment we say we're identical? They look right at us and go, yeah, I can tell. Yep, I see it. So now we're just sitting there like, well, which one, how, I'm just like, is there a little, I don't know, did I eat too much? I don't know what's going on. Listen, you laugh now, but when you're in middle school and someone compares you to a woman, that scars you as a child, all right? I need you to understand where I'm coming from. When someone says, you look identical to your twin sister, life doesn't go as easy from that point on, all right? It is something I totally expected adults to know and adults to figure out but they definitely did not, and some people just still don't. But maybe one day, one day they will. But I have to say, one of the biggest expectations in my life that pains me to this day for not coming true was one of my favorite football players when I was a kid, and especially growing up, watching him play. One of my favorite football players, a year I was watching football for the Chicago Bears, was going to break a record a specific year. He was going to break a record this specific year, and that one year that he was going to break this record, we cut him. And that player that I loved watching so much is a man by the name of Devin Hester, all right? For those of you who don't know who this man is, Devin Hester is the greatest kick returner in NFL history, all right? He's a great, he has the most, he has the record for most punt return touchdowns, most kickoff return touchdowns, and most returned touchdowns in NFL history, all right? And the year he could have broken the record, we let him go, and guess who picked him up? The Atlanta, fel- look how ugly that picture is. I, oh man, it hurts. It pains me to know that that was the jersey he was wearing when he broke the record. It really hurts. Because he literally broke, I remember watching it, oh, I can remember the call to this day. I'm, I'm, it's hurting me right now, all right, we need to hurry. But I remember to this day the call, how it happened, and going, he broke the record in an Atlanta Falcons jersey. That's how he broke the record. The record he had tied with Deion Sanders was broken in Atlanta, and as soon as he was done, he came back to Chicago, retired as a Bear, said it was one of his greatest accomplishments was playing for the Chicago Bears, but for one of the most amazing moments of his career, he accomplished it in Atlanta. And it's pained me, and still does to this day, knowing that the record was broken there and not in Chicago. But all these expectations, even being treated and talked to like I was identical to a woman in middle school, all these situations, All these things and expectations that I had are all things and are all situations that I think we can all relate to. Even if it's not to the same extent that I just said, even if it's not to the same extent as David, I think we can all relate to a situation where we expected one thing and then something else different happened. 
something completely different happened than what we had expected. And what's very interesting is when I look at David's life, I think his expectations were a bit more heavy than mine are. I think David's expectations had a little bit more weight to him, and I think that's completely understandable because David's expectations weren't from his own mind. They were from the mouth of God. My expectation to get a dog did not come from God. That literally came from growing up. David's expectation to be a king and to not have to worry and fear for his life did not come from his own mind. He didn't think of it one day. He didn't have a dream about it one day when he was sleeping. It literally came from a prophet who said, God has anointed you. And so when you have an expectation that is from God and yet it doesn't get fulfilled, sometimes the biggest thing that we need to do or that we feel like we need to do is just run and hide. It totally makes sense to where David is going in this situation because when we are in a season where it's not just our expectation but it's a promise and an expectation from God and yet we don't see it come to fruition, sometimes our number one reaction and we think all we can do is to logically just run and hide until God shows up. Like I think I can relate a whole lot more to David when I say that that one time in my life when I was reading through the Gospels and I understood that God is a God of healing and I prayed so hard at the end of high school that God would heal my right shoulder and that it would just be healed miraculously and yet it didn't happen and I still had to get surgery. That was a time when my expectation of God's word wasn't met. At least that's what I thought. Or the time when I thought that when God says in the book of Psalms that he gives us the desires of our heart as long as we submit to him and follow him, I thought, well, that means there surely can't be a relationship on this earth that can hurt me as long as I follow God. But it seems to be in my life that the moments that I followed God were the moments my desires got crushed the most. Those are the moments I feel like I can relate to David. Or the moment when I would read the book of Proverbs and the book of Jeremiah and understand that God does have a plan, God does have a call for my life, and yet it seems like the very thing that I'm doing to accomplish God's will is the last thing that I want to do in life because if I'm being honest with you, it just sucks in the moment. Those are the moments where I read the promises of God, I don't see it happening in my life, and I can totally relate to David. And if we're all being honest with ourselves, I think all of us have those moments in our life too. I think we can all list a few moments where we go, the Bible says this, and yet life is showing me something completely different. Life is not showing me what God's word says. And that's where we can learn and begin to learn from David. So let's take a look at what David, a man after God's own heart, did when he didn't see what God promised him. The first thing I think David did in this situation and the the promises that he was trying to see fulfilled in his life, the first thing David did in the cave of Adullam, which is so crucial, is that he accepted his situation. David accepted his situation. He accepted where he was at. 1 Samuel 22, verses 1 through 2, again, it starts out and says this. It says, so David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam, and when his brothers and father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. Verse 2 says, everyone who is in distress, everyone who is in debt, and everyone who is discontented gathered to him, and he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. What I love about this passage is David did not look at all the broken people around him and go, why are you here? Because you do not want to follow me, because as you can see, I'm running for my life and probably about to die. David did not look at the people who are in distress and say, go away. He welcomed them in and became captain over them. And that's so crucial. He didn't look at the people who were in debt and say, go away from me because I'm also in debt. You don't want to follow me. He didn't look to the people who are in distress and say, I'm also in distress. Why are you following me? Like, this is the last person you should want to follow. He didn't look to the people who are discontent and say, get away from me. I'm the captain of being discontent. Like, there's no reason you should want to follow me. It says he became captain over them. And a verse that I believe David applied to his life, and it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, is a verse out of James chapter 1, and it's verses 2 through 3. And it says this. It says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith 
produces steadfastness. Some other versions say that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And I think this is a great example of David living out this verse because this is the exact mindset that David had in the cave. He said, I realize I'm going through a test. I realize that I got here because of God. And so if I'm here, I might as well take captain over my situation and accept and acknowledge everything that's going on. And what I love about what David does and a realization that David has is that David was able to step back and realize and say to himself, if I am in this situation because I followed God, then I can help these people if they follow me. David was able to take a step back, analyze everything that was going on, and say, if I am in this cave because I'm following the anointing of God, then I can help these people if they follow me. David did not know the reason he was in the cave, and he didn't know the reason the 400 men were in the cave with him. All he knew was the answer, and the answer was God. And so he said, if I follow God to find my answer, these 400 men can follow me, and we can find our answer together. David accepted the situation that he was in. And this is the type of faith and the type of acceptance that we need to have when we are facing trials and seasons and moments of life. We need to be able to look to our situations and count it as joy, as hurtful as it may be, as, as unreasonable as it may be, even if we don't understand a thing that we're going through, we need to be like David and say, I'm going to be captain over my situation and acknowledge and understand that even if I don't know what's going on, God does. God does, and he is the one that I should strive to follow. What's super interesting about chapter 16 to chapter 22, and I was trying to find for the longest time the right place to put this in the message, but I just decided to put it as a little side note right here. Something that's really cool if you study the history line of David is that in chapter 16 when he is anointed, he is anointed to be the next king of Israel and the next leader of the Israelites. If you do quick research and look up what was the first time David was a leader over Israelites, it's not when he officially became king. The first time David was a leader over a group of Israelites was in the cave of Adullam when he was leading the 400 men. He didn't first lead the Israelites when Saul died and he then became king. The first time he led a group of Israelites was in the cave of Adullam. And I say that to say this. Sometimes God's promise fulfilled in our life does not look anything like we think it's going to look like. And that is a completely separate message for another day. And that's why I just want to put it as a side note. But point number two, point number two that we're going to move on to is he sought after God. David sought after God. And this is a crucial, crucial point that I need you to understand. It sounds so simple, but he sought after God. As we continue in chapter 22, verses 3 and 4 say this. It says, and David went from there to Mizpah of Noab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother come and stay with you until I know what God will do for me. Then he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him all the time that David was in the stronghold. If there's anything you can get from this and anything you can come to realize through this passage, it's that if you want to understand what God has called you to do, if you want to see where God is leading you through life, the number one thing you have to do is put your parents in a nursing home. No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. That's not what David's saying. But, <laughs> oh man, don't record that. What David is saying in this passage is he put his parents aside. He left his parents aside in order to focus on what God had for him. This is one of the most important steps and one of the most important things of David's story here in the cave of Adullam, but it's also super overlooked. It's super overlooked because David took time to realize the importance of seeking after God even when things seem to be going wrong. Matthew 6, verse 33 says this. It says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. A lot of us know this passage, but again, it is a passage that is much harder to apply when you are going through a season that you don't understand. And yet that is exactly what David does in his time in the cave. He seeks after God. He says, I don't know what God is doing, so I'm going to remove all distractions from my life, and I'm going to seek after God to understand what is going on. And David may not have had a great understanding of his situation, 
but he had a great understanding of prayer. He had a great understanding of it. He came to the realization and said, even if I'm in this cave because God led me here, God's the one who can lead me out. So I must seek after God in order to get to where God wants me to go. And it was through this prayer and through praying and seeking God that I believe David had a realization that if you go home with anything today, I hope you can hear this part. David had a realization that I hope all of us can make in this room and understand the importance of how important this realization is and that I hope all of us can take home and pray over this on our own quiet times with God. But the realization that David had was this. When he understood that he was going to take time apart for God, he understood that if God promises something and you don't see that promise, the problem wasn't God the problem was his sight. That's, that's a heavy thing right there that David understood. He understood if God made a promise, it's going to happen. If I don't see the promise, the problem is it's either not happened yet or I'm looking somewhere where it's not. David had the courage and the faith to say, God cannot lie, but I am flawed. So if God made the promise, the issue is me. If you look at verse three, right at the end, it says, uh, let, them, let my parents stay with you until I know what God will do for me. He doesn't say until I know where God messed up. He doesn't say until I can understand everything that God is trying to do through this situation. He says, until I understand what God is going to do for me. David knew in his heart that God was going to do something he just couldn't see it. And he had enough faith to go, if I can't see a promise of God, God is not the problem. And that is the faith and the understanding that we need to have in this room today, is, no, is go, when we look at the word of God, when God tells us a promise, when God tells us that something is going to happen, know that it's going to happen. Whether or not we see it happen in our lives or not is based off of how we see what God does in our lives. It's not always going to be something that's visible to us. It's not always going to be something we understand, but it is going to be true. And that is what David had the faith to say. The, f the third and final thing that I believe David did that was so crucial in his time in the cave of Adullam was he was willing to follow God's lead without question. David was willing to follow God's lead without question. If we look at verse 5 in chapter 22, it says this, it says, the prophet Gad said to David, do not stay in the stronghold, but depart and go to the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hareth. David shows right here his willingness to literally get up and follow God in a season of uncertainty by simply listening to a prophet without question. Things didn't have to make sense for David to follow the prophet. Things didn't have to be going well in his life for David to go, yeah, you're a prophet of God, you know what you're talking about. He simply was saying, yep, let's go. If what you say is from God, then it is something that I am going to follow. Another passage that I believe is so crucial and that I love so much in the word of God that David followed was out of Proverbs chapter three, verses five through six, and it says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. I love this verse, and for being honest, this is honestly one of those, those coffee cup verses that, that are really cute and that everyone has around, and we always, and we always look at it because it, it fills us with joy. But if we're being honest, I think the part of this verse so many people love is the part that says, trust in the Lord, and he will make your path straight. No one likes the middle where it says, don't rely on your own understanding. No one likes that part. And if, and if they say they do, I don't know if I believe you because no one really likes to acknowledge that God can do something that we have no idea what's going on. This is probably one of the hardest things that David had to apply. And yet when you read verse five, Gad literally tells him, the prophet literally tells him, go to Judah. And the next sentence says, so David departed and went. David went. David didn't need to understand he didn't need a reason. He wasn't looking to question God. He simply did not rely on his own understanding and was willing to follow God regardless of what he was going through. 
That is the faith that David had. David didn't need a reason. He didn't need a reward. He didn't need to understand. He just simply needed to be willing to follow God. And so what's interesting about this is that when we, when we come to the realization that this happens in our own lives as well, we need to ask ourselves, when God says go, do we go? Or when God says go, do we ask why? And I'm not even saying when God says go, do you just not go? I'm saying that even that moment of when God says go, if we pause, if we wait, if we go, wait a minute, can you explain to me why I'm going? Can you tell me what's in it for me? Can you tell me what it's gonna look like on the other side? That is the understanding that we have to be willing to drop when being led by God. And that's what David did so beautifully in verse five. It said, Gad told him to go and David went. David went. David was willing to go wherever God wanted him to go. And so when we look at these points from David's life, they all include one thing that's in common. They all include one thing that is in common, that is this, submission. Submission. David would not have been able to accept the situation he was in, seek after God, or follow God's lead without being able to submit to God. It wouldn't have happened. It just wouldn't have happened. David would not have been able to go as far as he did and go into what God had promised him if he was not willing to submit to everything that God had for him. And what's awesome is that we need to realize that that's the exact thing that we need to do. When we are in seasons of unknown, when we are in a season where we need to accept life, where we need to seek after God, and where we need to follow his lead, regardless of what's going on around us, we need to be willing to submit to God. And so that's what I wanna challenge you in this room today to do, for those that's watching online as well. I wanna challenge everyone who is watching today to submit to God. Regardless of what you're going through, regardless of the promise of God that you're waiting on, and regardless of what you may be thinking God's doing, when in reality he's doing something else, submit yourselves to God. Submit to Jesus and may he lead you to wherever he has promised and not to where we think he promised. Romans 8, 28, I wanna close with this, says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say when things work together for our understanding. It says when things work together for our good. We need to understand that there are some times in life where we're not going to understand anything, but God can still make good come out of it. But we have to be willing to follow God. And so we may be in a season of unknown, a season of doubt, and a season without reason, but praise God that even if we don't know the problem, we already know the answer like David did. And that answer is Jesus. That answer is God. The answer is following God. It's following Jesus Christ. And so this morning, as we close, I wanna pray for two groups of people in the house today. And I wanna pray specifically for those of us who may not even know Jesus. Some of us are going through a situation like this and it's the very reason we haven't given our lives to Jesus, when in reality, Jesus is the very answer that you need because of what you are going through, because of what your life entails. And so I wanna give people an opportunity to do that this morning. But the second group of people I want to pray for are those of us in the room who consider ourselves Christians, who say we do follow Christ, but at the end of the day, we could do a whole lot better at submitting to God, laying down our understanding, and trusting Him with everything that we have. So this morning, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to ask if there's anyone who wants to give your life to Jesus today, I want to give you the opportunity to do so. Even those of you watching, Online. So on the count of three, if you could slip up your hand and I can pray for you, that would be amazing. One, two, three, go ahead. If you'd like to give your life to Jesus, go ahead. Awesome. Awesome. Anyone else? Anyone else? Awesome. Well, hey, if you're watching online and you'd like to give your life to Jesus as well, I want to encourage you to click the button that says, I gave my life to Jesus, and we would love to get in contact with you, and we would love to pray for you as well. And the second group of people where I'm not even gonna ask for hands to be raised because I believe this should, this should be all of us in the room. I wanna pray that we would be able to submit our lives to God much better than we have in the past. So Jesus, we, we come before you today and I just thank you for everything that you have done 
through the life of David and through your word and how that has been able to speak to us and show us what it is that you want to communicate to us. God, I pray for those of us that gave our life to you today. I lift up everyone in this room, everyone online, everyone who is watching this message that gave their life to you today. God, I pray that you would begin a journey in their lives that is full of ups and yes, full of downs, but God, you would begin a journey where you are the center and the core of their life, Jesus. Jesus, we pray right now that the, that the people who gave their life to you, that God, they would be planted in good soil. You would surround them with good discipleship. God, surround them with the people they need in their lives to fulfill the life and fulfill the call that you have on their lives. God, may they not fall on the path of the rock that sprout up quickly, but then wither away because of the ways of this world. May they not be choked out by the weeds, but God, may they be growing in soil that you have prepared for them. And God, I pray for just the rest of our church. God, just the rest of our church, for everyone else who claims to be a follower of you, for everyone who claims to be a Christian, God, I pray that we would be willing to submit to you even in seasons that don't make sense. God, help us to submit to you even in seasons that don't make sense, where we don't know what's going on, where we wish we had an idea and an agenda of what's happening, but God, even when we don't, help us to submit to you, to accept our lives, to seek after you, and to follow your lead. God, help us in that situation. Help us to, willing, help us to be willing to humble ourselves submit to you and follow you regardless of what season and what time of life we are going through. God, we thank you for everything that you've done. We pray that you would receive all the glory and all the honor through today. And may your will be done throughout the rest of this day and the rest of this week. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.